In these uncertain times, finding certainty in the uncertainty of the future is a must. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. There's nothing more certain than uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds kind it. of funny to say it that way, but it's true. And, you know, when you think about it, it really is true. Yeah, there you... is nothing that we can really count on in this life. What we can count on is what's coming eternally. But, you know, King Solomon said, what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So there is some type of certainty there if we look at that. That is true. Even though the brother of Jesus, James, said, uh, those of you who say, uh, let's go into such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell, make up profits, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring. Your life is a mist. It can vanish in a moment. What you ought to say is if the Lord wills, we will do this and that. And it is this in your boasting that you're ignorant Mm. and arrogant. Yes. It's true. And, you know, no matter, people look at the things that have been done under the sun, you know, like the verse from Solomon says, um, and they think they can, they figured it out. They figured out this pattern or something here or there that's going to give them an edge. And maybe it does for a while. But going back to the fact of life, nothing's more uncertain than uncertainty. There's other things that have happened that have overthrown all that certainty in the past, and we know those are going to happen again. And, and they happen There's more frequently be that than we... Of uncertainty. They happen more frequently than most people realize. Like, like, like some examples of that, the big the crash of 1929, World War II, um, all of the things that went along with that, even the technical revolution uh, blindsided a lot of people who didn't realize you know, where the wealth was going to shift in the economy. Well, and do any of us know where the wealth exactly is going to shift? Not really. No, we know there will be shifts, but um, and we hope, you know, we position ourselves to receive some of that shift, um, but, but we don't know, not for a fact. And then we look at Social Security, which was supposed to secure everyone's income in the United States, and mm. um, now we've, we've learned that that doesn't even have to be paid to people, even if they paid it in all their life, uh, Supreme Court yeah. ruling. Or what about the pension plans that went defunct because they were not funded like they should have been? You know, that was something the government was supposed to put money away for the Social Security program <laughs> and oversee the pension plans, make sure enough money was being put away by private companies in that instance or by the state governments uh, to make sure that those pensions were funded. But in, in social, the case of Social Security, they decided to spend the money and replace it with IOUs, bonds, basically, you know, to pay back in to the Social Security fund so they could spend the money today. Mm -hmm. But that's really not new because you go back to uh, Benjamin Franklin. He set up a fund back in his day that was going to grow at compounded interest to be a big, uh, to provide a big uh, beneficial interest someday to the city of Philadelphia. Kind of like an endowment plan. Right. Well, the city of Philadelphia decided to spend it early and then, of course, never grew to those <laughs> astronomical proportions that he was hoping. So that's a history that we know that some people aren't trustworthy. Governments are not trustworthy. And our founding fathers realized that years ago. That's why we they put we the people in charge of government and not to let the uh, the tyranny occur because government always tyrannizes its population. So as we're talking about Social Security, what it was supposed to be, what it really isn't, and then pensions, how they were supposed to be, but they're not funded properly, it makes, I, I just have a picture of, it makes me want to get on the floor and kick and scream like a little toddler <laughs> and throw a tantrum. <laughs> But if I do that, it's not going to fix anything. No. And, and if you do that, it's not going to fix anything. So we could just keep talking about it till we're blue in the face. Or we can say, okay, these things don't work, but what can we do to make things better for our future? Well, we have the certainty that they don't work. And that's what we're looking <laughs> yeah. for. And we know they don't work. Now we can move on to something that has a history that does work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned how the founders, you know, wanted to make a government that we the people would be in control of to get away from the tyrannical power that England was, um, was imposing over the colonies. But even the founding fathers recognized that our form of government would not last forever. And in fact, John Dickinson, I think it was, put it into words. Of course, I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the exact quote in front of me. He was one of the people that was involved in the in those uh, the early the founding of the Constitution. He said, um, "Shall we establish establish nothing good because we know it cannot last forever?" Ah, 
Yeah. It is a, they, they knew the depravity of man, that eventually it would decay, you know, and have to have to be revamped. He said, but we know we should establish it and design it in such a way that it can last as long as the nature of things will permit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, and then George the structure Washington... is there for the, the people to come back in and redesign that from time to time, because that, you know, everything will decay over time. Mm-hmm. And of course, George Washington said that the government that they did set up would only work if it was a religious and moral people. It was John Adams. It was John Adams yeah. that said that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we've lost some of those morals. We've lost some of the, the the godliness that the founding fathers had that was put into our form of government. And so it can't work. It's like putting a, you know, a round hole in a square hole, mm-hmm. square, a round, pe- round peg into a square <laughs> hole. It doesn't fit or vice versa. Um, yeah. But, you know... Um, you talked about uh, we have to change things, and, and a lot of people today want to to set up something that is going to take you know, these thousand year trusts. You've heard of them, where yeah. they want to yeah. make it, they want to dictate what we don't even know enough in our own short lifespan what's going to happen, let alone a thousand years from now. Well, you were just reading there's going to be a new sort of tax on those trusts. There is. So. In, in 2023, the IRS uh, released Revenue Ruling 2023 2. Mm. And it says the IRS has confirmed that assets inherited in an irrevocable trust. That's an irrevocable, so those. That's that's an irrevocable. Which irrevocable trusts, by the way, already pay some of the highest income tax rates. So you don't really want assets that are earning incomes in an irrevocable trust for a long time. And now they're going to be subject to capital gains tax as well. Interesting. Ouch. Yeah. So So people trying to set up something that's going to be after them. We don't even know, just like James says, we don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. Mm-hmm. So really, we, we um, can't control the government. We can't necessarily control our, uh, you know, the future of what's going to happen with our posterity, but we can uh, control t- a de- to a decree what happens in our own life right now with the things that we can control. It's much easier to want to uh, plan diets for somebody else rather than mind our own plate. But mm-hmm, that's yeah. where the power is that, if we mind our own plate. It really is. And Solomon said in the Bible, you know, the, do not ask why were the former days so much better than this. And mm-hmm. we, can, we can look back, you know, in many ways, the days we are living in today are, lo- are better in a lot of ways. And much yet, better looking in back some in some ways, we can say, oh, well, back then they had it so much better in this area. Mm-hmm. Well, he says, don't ask that. Because it's not from wisdom that you ask about this. Ooh, yeah. not from wisdom that we ask that. So what are the questions we do need to ask from wisdom? Well, that's a moral and religious statement because we have to realize that who is in control of this universe? It's not us as much as many people would like to think we can control the climate and we can control you know, how many people live in a certain area and we can control all these things. It is God who's in control of this universe. Mm -hmm. And he has certain laws, universal laws that he's put into place, you know, the laws of nature and uh, and nature's God that the founders recognize. And if we violate those, we know the consequences. It might not happen immediately, you know. God said Adam would die as soon as when he ate the fruit of the... He didn't die immediately physically, but he died immediately spiritually. Mm-hmm. And um, and then in God's grace, he took him out of the garden so that he wouldn't eat of the, gar- of the tree of life and live forever in that abominable that state. state. Yeah. yeah. So things that have happened... John, you were talking about Benjamin Franklin, how he wanted to set up that fund that would compound and be a huge endowment for the city of Philadelphia and how the... The silly fathers of uh, Philadelphia spin it all, mm-hmm. okay? And uh, But Benjamin Franklin was really, really instrumental in starting whole life insurance in this country too. And uh, he understood the power of a private organization, not attached to government, not regulated by government, that was mutually working together how it could set up and prepare for the events that happen while we're living and also give the next generation a step up. Mm-hmm. And it's called whole life insurance. And it supersedes the IRS code. It accumulates cash value, which can be used for assisted living or retirement needs or anything else that you need. You can access that tax-free. It provides a tax-free inheritance to your beneficiaries. It is associated, it's not associated with a bunch of attorney fees like a lot of trusts are. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it can be a great estate planning tool 
without having to pay a bunch of fees for that either. So all these things are available to us with a tool that was been using for a couple of hundred years. Yeah, okay. so, so just a quick recap on the history of, of life insurance. It kind of goes back to the days, you know, when the, you know, it, you, you could take it way back to like the Roman Senate when they put together a, a burial fund yes. for, for different members of the Senate. Um, but then it kind of dies out in history, and then it comes back again when you have the people, Lloyds of London, watching all the ships go out. And yeah, and the Renaissance period, back. it came back. Because yeah. the Dark Age, it, it was a setback to all, all society. Yes. So then you have insurance reinstated there. And then Benjamin Franklin, like you were mentioning, he was involved in founding an insurance company. I think it was in 1761 that the first one started here in this country. Yeah, the Presbyterian he, Fund. He, uh-huh. he was involved in that. So and that for, was before even the Declaration of Independence. Yes, yes it was. Yes. Wow, 1761. So, that, that's going back a ways. It is. And so he was involved in setting that up. And for, for years, they only sold term insurance then. And then in the middle of the 1800s is when whole life insurance came along, as because it, it was that was kind of a consumer demanded product. Yes. But Benjamin Franklin helped set the foundation for then what would the, those companies that would later start the whole and that, life insurance. And that company, products. that Presbyterian Fund, stayed operating until the mid 1990s when it was bought out by MetLife. Interesting. So tell us why you said. The term insurance Mm -hmm. was there, and then whole life insurance because it was a consumer demanded product. So tell us about that. And and you write about this a little bit in your book, Winning Your Financial Game. You have a timeline in the back of that book as to how this development uh, happened along here. But people realized that for things like fire insurance... um, car insurance, you know, they probably didn't have cars back in those days, but things like that, you, you pay. And if something happens, then your property is replaced. And, and that's, you know, that's always a possibility that you could have a fire, you could have something that destroys your property. Makes sense to cover that with term insurance because you're going to have to renew that from time to time. The risk really isn't going up Mm -hmm. over time, but with life insurance, the risk is going up all the time. Because the older you get, the more likely you are to die. So a lot of people, even today, still cover their life with term life insurance. The premiums start out pretty nice for someone that's young. Yeah, in their twenties, okay. yeah. thirties, it's you, you can get you know twenty, thirty year term for very inexpensive. But if you don't die within those twenty or thirty years, which most people don't, then the premiums to renew are significantly higher. So with term insurance, there so, is certainty. In the future, for a certain period of time, but for a limited not time. Yeah. for a limited time. But with whole life insurance, there's certainty in the future for your lifetime. So that's why it was a consumer-driven product. People realized, you know, with fire insurance, the risk isn't ever going up. So yeah, it makes sense just to pay that on an as-we-go basis. For life insurance, my risk is going up all the time, and so I want something that kind of builds equity like a mortgage, so that if I don't die within the specified term, that I don't lose my life insurance, but I could get I could get the money back that I paid for it when I didn't didn't use it. And so that's how whole life insurance came along. Well and then another thing, to be fair, 20, 30 year term back then, um, life expectancy was much lower. Mm-hmm. I, Benjamin Franklin was an old guy. I think he lived yeah. to be in his eighties. And uh, he was very old, where a lot of the guys only lived to be Died in their 30s, 40s. So, so the average the average life expectancy was about 35, but you had a lot of infant mortality that was helping with that sure. as, as mm-hmm. well. And so oh, you, know, sure, you, you obviously sense. had a lot of guys that were in their 50s and whatnot. But yeah, the 80s, that, that was old uh-huh. for, for someone in that era. So today, uh, a lot of people are putting a lot of uh, dependency on 401ks, IRAs, 403bs, and, and these type of accounts. And yet when we look at how those accounts have performed... Uh, because they're based on the uncertainty of the market. Um, someone that is, you know, 35 years old and putting 4% of their income into a whole life insurance policy will have more cash value in it than the median 401k balance when the time time to retire. Wow. And it's guaranteed by a contract, whereas your 401k balance is not. And you can get to it throughout your lifetime to use it. Yeah, you don't have things. to wait till you retire you to be able to access and now, use that money along the way. Now that does come with a risk, right? Because you could use it and not pay it back. Oh, sure. And then you lose the benefits. Sure. But then you, the uncertainty so is on res- you. It, it comes with responsibility, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And yeah. so 
Yes, yeah, so, so many people put their money in the way into tax qualified plans and then wish that they could access it maybe to start a business, to do something that they know is going to give a nice return on it, or to keep just to keep from paying interest to other people. Mm-hmm. For example, just here in the last few months, we've seen interest rates rise uh, quite a bit from what they were. People got used to that period of low interest rates. Now they have a lot higher interest rates. For people that have liquidity in their life insurance, though, they have a source to turn for that funding, whereas people that don't are stuck paying those high interest rates. Yeah. And so people who don't, yeah. they're now turning to whole life insurance, realizing, hey, I got to get this started so that it will be there for me in the future. I received an email from somebody yesterday that was running a amortization schedule at 8.7% interest. And they were sending me back the, the interest numbers that they were looking at. And they said, I, I don't think this can be right because the interest <laughs> is so high. I, I checked the math. The numbers are right. They're just yeah. not used to that high interest rate. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we've seen high interest rates before. In yeah. fact, is in uh, 1982, Nelson Nash was facing 23% interest on raw land that he was purchasing. And Nelson Nash, he's the author of Becoming Your Own Banker and where he really expounds on the infinite banking concept and using whole life insurance, the cash values of whole life insurance uh, during your lifetime. And At that time, he saw his eyes were open and he says, I can get this money from my life insurance policies that I've had 20, 25 years for 6 and 8%. Why am I paying 23% to the snakes and dragons? Yeah. And he basically refinanced for it with himself by borrowing against his life insurance policies, paying off those um, mortgage, those, and, uh, and then just paying himself what he, uh, at a comfortable and affordable pace back to his policies, just like he would have had to pay those, uh, those mortgages on that real estate, only he set the pace, mm-hmm. not someone else. Yeah. And that's called freedom. And being able to understand that and knowing that, um, there's never a better time than right now to start building a reserve of cash value. Um, even when interest rates are high, it doesn't matter. We should be very diligent in the way that we plan our future so the Lord can direct our steps. Because Jeremiah the prophet said, we don't belong to ourselves. How is it that we should be given the authority to direct our steps? So, but we do need to plan. That's our part. Yeah, we do need to plan. And one of the one of the great tools that we have in being able to plan for the future and it is to study history. And there's there's different ways to study history, right? You can learn, you can look at what's happened in the past, understand the the certainty in the uncertainty or the uncertainty in the certainty that always happens like we've been talking about today. Uh, there's also of course an academic way to study history that is not usually practically applied toward understanding the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so you see people that are getting history degrees just studying history for the sake of history, um, but there has to be wisdom mm-hmm. in, in order for that study to be useful and in a way to apply it to the future, understanding where history does apply, where it could be different, and understanding the, uh, the uncertainty that comes through the certainty that we see in everyday life is a big part of... Um, a part of that practical application. So yeah. just the other day, Tom and I, your dad and I were um, driving in the car and we were talking and um, we were having to make some decisions about things. And uh, the quote that came to mind was by Albert Einstein when he says, imagination is more important than knowledge. Hmm. There comes a point when you get this knowledge, maybe you've studied history, you, whatever your knowledge is, you've got to take all that knowledge and then use it to make decisions. Yeah. And it's your imagination. Because what if the decision doesn't work out? (laughs) Well, first of all, you've got to use your imagination to be able to take that information and to apply it to your situation. And then, yes, John, what if it's not the right decision? Mm -hmm. Well, we always want to make a right decision if we can. We've got to make a decision. We try to choose the right one, and then we work to make it right. Yeah. So there's not always a crystal clear path to go. Is Do I go right? Do I go left? Both have appealing things. I've got to weigh it. I've got to make a decision. We're at the fork in the road. Uh, Go left. And then along the way, you correct for whatever you need to. It's kind of like on your GPS. Uh, you know your destination. 
Um, but sometimes you might make a wrong turn, but you get back on. Or maybe there's an accident ahead and they tell you another route to go. But you still have the end goal in mind. It just it it's just that it might change a little bit along how fast you're traveling or or which way you use to get there. You know, this makes me think of a couple of scripture verses. One of them is, uh, you know, now um, faith is the is the evidence of things hoped for. Uh, and you know, faith is the substance of, of things, things hoped for, the evidence, evidence of things, things not seen. seen. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, and then we find in in another verse that we're to add to our faith virtue, mm-hmm. and then to virtue knowledge. And if we get the knowledge ahead of the faith or the virtue, we get a society like we're facing today, mm-hmm. because we've taken that faith and that virtue out of it, and we've just given a lot of knowledge. And um, You have more educated derelicts We've talked a lot about, Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked a lot about stuff, John, you're talking about history and how we study it. If we're not studying history through a moral and religious attitude, we're going to miss the essence of what it can teach us. Yeah, we'll miss the lessons there for us. It'll just be a bunch of knowledge. Uh We talk to a lot of people uh, every single week. Some people don't want to leave a better world for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Those people we usually can't help. We're here to help people that want to make the world better today and for the next generation. And that's really the essence of whole life insurance. Mm-hmm. And it's got a history behind it that is reliable and dependable. It's been around for over 200 years. It's still working just like it was set out to work unlike a lot of the other things that were promised by government, corporations, employers, you name it. Mm -hmm. This is something that's been dependable. And um, according to some reports, 70% of Americans will never be able to create an estate without it. Yeah. I I want to mention something just briefly here. Uh, This is kind of an aside since we're talking about whole life insurance. We've talked about how interest rates have gone up. Um, You know, that's one of the uncertainties that we face. But along with this rise in interest rates, we've also seen inflation going rampant the last few years. And that's one of the concerns that comes up when people are talking about whole life insurance that, well, what about inflation? If I put my money here, you know, this whole life is just this slow and steady wins the race. Isn't inflation just going to eat it alive? And so there are a couple defenses that whole life insurance has against inflation. Number one is that, you know, that, that growth is going to continue. Um, but inflation, remember, is going to have a, a decreasing effect on your premium dollars that you're paying in too. So mm-hmm. that's going to help you out a little bit. Absolutely. And then on the other side of it, you know, you don't have to, your, your money's not stuck in the whole life insurance policy. You can take a policy loan to, to buy, you know, real assets and things as the opportunities come up. We don't know what those are going to be in advance, but, you know, real estate is an example of what might be an option, you know, that, that tends to do well with inflation. So we don't know the future. That's one of the uncertain elements, but whole life insurance gives you the tools to deal with that as the opportunities and the occasions arise. And John, you mentioned uh, Winning Your Financial Game. Uh, that was your dad's second book. Yes. Um, you said in the back of there, it kind of gives the history of the whole life insurance, where that came from. Yeah, there's an so, a, the timeline. So that would be a great little um, history study there. And also that chapter goes through, oh, that book has like 20, 21 chapters talking about different principles of finance, um, you know, thinking in percent rather than just looking at a price tag. I, I know that's one of the things that's discussed in there. Um, really, really good short chapters, mm-hmm. just really um, succinct uh, lessons in finance. So they can get a copy of the Winning Your Financial Game. And will you link it to the... Yes, I'll put a link in the resources to this podcast. You can go to our website, life-benefits.com, or call our office at 702-660-7000. We'll make sure you can get a copy of that book. All right. Well, for those of you listening for the first time to this podcast, I think you figured out that we're pretty religious people. We believe in God, (laughs) we believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, and we believe that ultimately he is preparing for us a place that far out and supersedes anything we could do here on earth. But while we're left here on earth, we have a responsibility and a duty to make this world a better place for the next generation. And that's why we are so excited about what we do with life insurance and serving other people. 
That's right. You're listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Have a wonderful week.